You know, this is a, a special season uh, of the year, and, uh, and it's a special season for us as a church family. And, uh, you know, this uh, traditionally kind of start of the year, you know, uh, you know, in the world in which we live, uh, you know, it's kind of like you can do better, you can feel better, you can, you know, be better by trying harder. Anybody uh, kind of know what I'm talking about, you know? Just think about your diet right now. Think about kind of your fitness health habits, right? And uh, man, I know for me, I just need to try a little harder in some areas. You know, I'm trying to lose a little weight. And uh, as you guys can all keep me accountable, right? You are my accountability partner. But um, as you know, and we've been talking about this as a church family now for a number of months, that we live in an alternate story. We don't live the story of culture where it's like, hey, I'm just going to try harder. I'm just going to try and work it out. Um, God has invited us into an alternate story, a different story, a different way of being human, a different way of doing life. In fact, there's a, a church, the church calendar. Uh, we just celebrated Advent together through the Christmas season, which is all about the longings of the heart and how God has come through his son, Jesus, and he invites us. He invites us to come. But what's next on the church calendar, uh, historically and traditionally, is a season that's called Epiphany. And, and Epiphany is a season in the, in the kind of the calendar of the church when the church would set aside time in many respects to respond to the invitation of Christmas. Christmas is that God came near, that God, Emmanuel, came to be with us. And the invitation, as we learned through Christmas, was come be with me, come be with me, come be with me. Epiphany, that, that next season on the calendar of the church, so to speak, is responding to the invitation. It's an opportunity for us to renew our commitment, renew our union, renew kind of our, our, our desire, our longing to be with Jesus. And I don't think there's a better way to start off the year, do you? For us to set time aside um, the Bible, and when you read through the Old Testament especially, um, the children of God, the people of God, were oftentimes calling sacred times when the Lord was calling them to set time aside to seek his face. Now, we know that God's omnipresent. We know that God is everywhere, right? There's not one thing that escapes his attention. God knows when a hair falls from your head, and the older I get, the more hairs that are falling from my head. God knows but the Bible also teaches us that God is, he is manifest his presence or his presence is personally with us. In fact, he said this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He said, come to me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And every single one of us in this room pushes around a wheelbarrow full of fears and anxieties, cares, concerns, responsibilities, failures. We all have them. We all carry them around. We all push them around with us. And what the Lord was saying through Jesus, what he was saying to his disciples and what he's saying to us is, I want you to come to me. Hey, come, by, come near. Come be with me. Set some time aside. Push aside the distractions, the craziness of the world. Push aside this season. Set some time aside to come and be with me. See, it says in James 4, 8, if you come to me, I'll draw, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. If you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. See, God's promises are yes and amen. And when we respond to the invitation of God to be with him, Right? When we respond to his invitation to come to him, he will meet with us. And so we're setting this time aside. We're setting the next two weeks aside. And, and this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, some of you thought you were going to get out in 30 minutes after 10 minutes of worship. But I'm not going to let you do that. <laughs> we want to spend some time in God's presence. And we're going to teach a little bit. We're going to worship a little bit. We're going to pray a little bit this morning. And I believe that at the end of this morning's service, you're going to encounter God in a way that maybe you've never encountered him before, that his presence would come and be with you, that, that he would come and say, I want to spend time with you over the next two weeks, and that God captures your heart this morning, and that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you say, you know what, 
the most important thing is, is maybe not that cup of coffee. It's maybe not me getting showered and getting out the door. No, no, I'm gonna spend 15 minutes, just 15 minutes in his presence. I'm gonna be in his word as Aaron taught us last week. And so here's what I want us to do. We're gonna go back and we're gonna sing a worship song and I'm gonna then come back up. I'm gonna teach a little bit and then we're gonna worship again and we're gonna pray a little bit. Is that okay? Can we do that this morning? How many of you are hungry for God's presence? How many of you are saying, man, I want his presence? Come on, we wanna make room for him this morning. So here's what I want us to do. Would you all stand with me? And this might be a little bit weird, but if we all do it together, then it's okay. <laughs> See, the Bible says, lift up holy hands. In fact, it says throughout the Psalms all over and over and over again, man, lift up your hands, lift up your hands. Why would we do that? Well, you know this is kind of the international sign of surrender, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I give up, I'm surrendering, right? And what we're doing as a church family this year is we're not stepping into this year going, I'm gonna try harder, right? We're actually stepping into this year saying, Lord, I'm giving myself to you. I'm yielding to you because I live a different story. My story's not dependent on me. My story's dependent upon you. And you made all these promises to be with me and to walk with me and to abide with me and to dwell with me and to lead me and to guide me. So why would we not start the year by saying, Lord, I surrender all to you? And so here's what I want you to do. Would you just lift your hands this morning? And we're just saying, Lord, as, a, as, a, as individuals, Lord, as families, as husbands and wives, as Father, as, as a spiritual family, as a church family, Lord, we're coming into your presence where two or three people are gathered in your name. You are there in the midst, Lord. You're already here. But Lord, what we're doing right now is, Lord Jesus, we're lifting up our hands just as a symbol to lift up our hearts before you to say, Lord Jesus, we are surrendering to you. At the very outset of this year, Lord Jesus, we're not trying harder. We're not going to try and uh, muddle our way through it and figure it out on our own strength. But Lord Jesus, no, no, no. We're laying down our crowns. Lord Jesus, we're laying down our hearts. We're laying down our lives. Lord, we're recognizing this morning, even as you taught us in Matthew chapter 6, hallowed be your name. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the ultimate one in our lives. Lord Jesus, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to seek you. We want to be led by you and so Jesus, right now, Lord, we're just making room for you. Lord, we're offering you our hearts. We're presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice this morning. And Lord, the cry of our collective heart is, Lord, would you meet us? Would you be with us? Oh God, would you as we make room for you, fill, fill, fill. Lord Jesus, over and over and over again, throughout the Bible, we see that when we are emptied, when there were empty pots, you filled them, Lord Jesus. When there were empty lives, you filled them. Lord Jesus, when there were empty rooms, you filled them. Lord Jesus, you were a God who fills those who would empty themselves. And Lord, we empty ourselves of ourselves, our own will, our own way, our own thinking. And Lord Jesus, this morning, we are asking as we make room that you would fill us. Oh, fill us afresh and anew with your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, come on, let's make room.
that is our prayer. Lord, even as we, Lord, begin the year together as a church family, Lord, we're, Lord, just offering ourselves. We want to make room for you, Lord. We want to surrender our hearts, our will, our ways, Lord Jesus, our thoughts about the year ahead, Lord Jesus. We make our plans, and Lord, we try to, Father, plan and detail it all out, but Lord, you order our steps, and so, Lord Jesus, this morning, Lord, at the very outset, Lord Jesus, of our year together, Lord, we're saying, Lord, we're making room. We're surrendering. Lord, we're inviting you in. We're asking you to meet with us, Lord, to lead us and to guide us in Jesus' precious name. Come on, everybody said amen, amen, amen. You guys can go ahead and grab your seat. And, uh, and I'm just going to really just kind of pick up and dive in. We're going to go back into worship in a little bit. I'm going to spend just a few minutes unpacking a few things from God's word that that uh, I just believe the Lord has kind of laid on my heart for us uh, this year, and there's some really special things that we'll do over the next couple of weeks, and January 30th is going to be a great weekend. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a special time uh, for us to kind of be together, but um, I just want to kind of continue in this vein of just what does it mean for us if, if we're posturing ourselves not as the world would posture itself, but as the kingdom of God would posture itself, as we, the people of God, would posture ourselves if we're posturing ourselves to say, Lord, we're inviting you in, we want to be in your presence, you know, what are some of those things that maybe we could just kind of practically kind of walk out? And uh, I was meditating this week on, uh, on kind of Jesus' first miracle, and uh, you're probably familiar with it if you've been around church, you know, it's a great miracle. He turns water into wine. Good one, Jesus. I love that, right? You know, and, and not only any kind of wine, he turns it into the best kind of wine, right? Like, what? You know, why did you save this stuff to the end, you know? And, uh, and that's just like Jesus. Jesus only does the best stuff, right? Um, but, but the story was really kind of impacting me. I was just thinking about it. You know, there's so many things that you could kind of read into that story and draw out of that story. You know, Jesus goes to this wedding and, and uh, they run out of wine and uh, Mary, you know, his mother comes to him and says, you know, come on, Jesus, you got to do something about this, you know? And, uh, and uh, you know, Jesus is like, my time has not yet come, you know, blah, 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 you know? He's like trying to back off of it or whatever. And, and it's so funny because Mary 
Mary turns to the servants and goes, whatever he says, just do it. And I don't know if that's a mother's intuition that she just knew her son was going to do it, you know. But uh, so you know the story, he turns the water into wine. But there was this little verse found in verse 2 of chapter 2 that really just caught my attention this week. And it was simply this, Jesus also was invited to the wedding. Jesus also was invited to the wedding. And it got me thinking this morning that what might have happened if Jesus hadn't have been invited to the wedding? I mean, I'm sure the wedding would have gone on. I'm sure the photographer showed up, and I'm sure the cake decorator showed up, and right, I'm sure the, you know, the, wedding, you know, the wedding coordinator was there, and hopefully the minister was there, you know, all that kind of stuff. The wedding probably would have continued, but the miracle wouldn't have happened. And as I was meditating and thinking about it this week, I felt like the Lord was just kind of stirring in my spirit that, that here's an ordinary routine thing that's happened millions and millions of times, but Jesus was invited to this particular wedding. Jesus was invited into the ordinary, into the routine, into the mundane, into something that was, man, that's happened a million times. And when Jesus was invited into that which was ordinary, into that which was routine, when Jesus was invited into it, a miracle took place. And it got me thinking about 2022. It got me thinking as I've been praying and fasting and spending time before the Lord for you this week. I've been thinking about what would it look like if you and I invited Jesus into our ordinary, into our mundane, into our routine. What if rather than start out the year, it was kind of an idea of, man, I'm going to try a little harder. I'm going to do something. What if we invited God into our, our lives? What if we responded to his invitation to be with him? And extended him an invitation to say, Jesus, come be with us. What might happen? Is it possible that miracles might happen? There's this story in the Old Testament about the story of Joshua. And, uh, you, you know, Joshua had taken over from Moses. Moses had led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. He led them out of Egypt. Moses was dead. Joshua came. And uh, Joshua is now leading the children of Israel. He's on the banks of the Jordan River, and he's about to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And he declares, and he says this in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 5. He says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. And, 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 and echoes of the wedding story where God was there present. He'd been invited. Jesus had been invited to the wedding. And God, Jesus, performs a miracle in that scenario. You go back to the Old Testament and you see the same pattern. Here are the people of God about to enter into the promise that God has given them. Even though they've been distracted, they've wandered for 40 odd years. God never forgot his promise. God led them to the Jordan River. God was leading them into the promised land. And the way in which they would step into their future, step into to the promises of God, step into the miracles that God had prepared for them was that they had to consecrate themselves. They had to dedicate themselves. That was their responsibility. Their responsibility was to dedicate, to set aside, to consecrate, to give themselves to God. God's responsibility then would be to perform the miracles. And I got to tell you, I believe we have only just begun. We're only scratching the surface of the things that I believe God has in store for us as a church family. That there are miracles in this house. That there are people's lives that are going to be turned around. There are friends and family members that are far away from God. Maybe in all kinds of turmoil and trouble. That God wants to touch them. God wants to call them. God wants to bring them into his presence. There are challenges, burdens, walls that you're bumping up against. That the Lord wants to break through for you this year. But we have a responsibility. As Joshua said to the children of Israel. Consecrate yourselves. Dedicate yourself. Set yourself aside. Offer yourself up. Surrender yourself to God. Make room for him. And Joshua was echoed then in Romans chapter 12 when Paul said this. He said, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, that by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
And what Paul is doing here, he is, he's picking up on what, on what um, Joshua had started back in Joshua chapter three, and he's saying, no, 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 listen, we as the people of God, we've got to constantly be offering ourselves, dedicating ourselves, giving ourselves to Jesus. I don't know about you, but um, you know, I, I always start out the year, um, every year I start out with the same resolu- New Year's resolution. This year I'm going to lose 20 pounds. And, uh, and it never happens, by the way, so, you know, don't hold your breath <laughs> for a better-looking Gareth, you know. Because what happens is, um, it's like this creep kind of comes in, you know. And I drive by Pete's, and I go, you know, vanilla latte sounds really good right now. You know what, I went to the gym three times this week, and I deserve a vanilla latte, so. I go into Pete's, and I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm just ordering a vanilla latte, but then I see one of those lemon poppy seed scones. Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And, and then the barista goes, do you want anything to go with that? Well, that vanilla latte is looking very lonely without the scone. And so, yeah, you know what? Let's get a scone with that, you know? And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm creeping. There's like this creep that just kind of happens. The same thing happens, doesn't it, in our spiritual life? Like, we get crowded in. Things happen to us. Like, you know, there's the distractions of the world in which we live and all the responsibilities that go on in our home and our job and finances and the world. And just, man, it just, we just can get overwhelmed. And, and what Paul was saying and what Joshua was saying, hey, hey you got to set some time aside. You've got to carve out some sacred time, some time that's just for you and Jesus. Another way, and this is what we, we see throughout the Old Testament, is that they would build an altar. And, and altars were something that, you know, were, we, you read it throughout the Old Testament over and over and over again. You know, they would build an altar, build an altar. What was the, all this building altar stuff about? You know, and there were really kind of a few purposes for building an altar in the Old Testament. One was that they would memorialize an encounter with God or they would be seeking an encounter with God. And so they would take time to build an altar. And then once they built the altar, they would bring a sacrifice to the altar. Why? Because they wanted to encounter God. On that altar, there was also a sacrifice, not just for sin. You know, you read the Old Testament, and it's kind of pretty gory. You know, there's all these sacrifices and bulls and goats and doves and all this. What is all that stuff about? Well, well, there was this sacrifice for sin that was taking place, but there was also a sacrifice of praise or a sacrifice of thanksgiving that was taking place on those altars. And the last thing that happened on an altar is that throughout the Old Testament, when you see altars take place, what was happening was that they were building an altar that was declaring their allegiance to God. You see, the pagan nations around Israel, the children of God, they also built altars, but they built altars to false gods, and they sacrificed to false gods. In fact, it's really interesting. Read, you can go through the Old Testament and read about the altars that the children of Israel built, and whichever altar they built and to whomever they built it, you could see kind of their, the journey of their spiritual life. They were building altars. They were giving themselves. Now, we don't build altars per se in 2021 or 2022. Penny in the jar. We don't build altars, right? And yet, in some senses, we do. We obviously don't build an altar to sacrifice for sin. Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 10, tells us that once and for all, Jesus sacrificed for our sin. But we do build spiritual altars, We build places in our hearts where we say, God, I want to encounter you. We build spiritual altars in our hearts that bring sacrifices of praise. And that might be a new term to you. That might be, what what do you mean by a sacrifice of praise? Well, I don't always feel like praising Jesus. Can I just be honest? That might shock you. What? The pastor doesn't always feel like praising Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Because oftentimes or many times, life doesn't go maybe the way I expect it. Or maybe I was hoping for one thing and God had other plans and it was going another direction. And in those moments, I have a choice. In those moments, you have a choice, right? I can choose to grumble. I can choose to complain or what? I can choose to offer a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so we can also kind of build these altars in our heart because what God is after in this season is God is after your and my heart. You know, what does it say in Proverbs 
3, verse 5. Some of you have a coffee cup with that verse on it. And it says, what did it say? It says, trust in the Lord with half your heart. Oh, no. No, what does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What is God after? God's after all of our hearts, right? Remember the story in 1 Samuel where uh, uh, Samuel shows up to the house of Jesse, and Jesse has all of these good-looking sons, and then this guy by the name of David who's out tending sheep. And Samuel shows up, and he says, God's spoken to me, and the next king of Israel is coming out of your family. Uh, Can you imagine how Jesse felt? You know, that's like winning the lottery, right? Are you kidding me? The next king of Israel is going to come out of my family? Great. Boys, get showered. Line up, you know. And so he lines them all up. And, and, and Samuel's going down the line, and he goes, nope, it's not him. Nope, it's not him. It's not him. And he gets to the end of the line, and there's not one of them that's called to be the next king. And, and he turns to Jesse, and he says, do you have any more sons? Because I know the Lord spoke to me that the next king is going to come out. And you know the story because he says, oh, yeah, I've got this, this kind of run to the family. You know, he's out tanning sheep right now, you know. And uh, can you imagine, you know, you know, David comes, they call David back, and David comes back in, and he probably smells like sheep and dear knows what else. And uh, he's probably all kind of, you know, but, but, you know what, what's going on, you know. And, and, uh, and immediately the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, that's the one. But there's this little verse in there. It says this, man looks at the outward. What does God look at? The heart. And that's what makes following Jesus so, so challenging. It's why God or Jesus always went after the Pharisees, right? Because the Pharisees were always perfecting how they looked on the outside. They tithed and they, you know, and they fasted and they gave and they made sure that everybody knew about it. And Jesus described that as self-righteousness. In fact, he called it filthy rags. Because what Jesus was after was the heart. You know, at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching, and he says this. He says, hey, um, you know, he says, he says you've, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But if you look at a woman in your heart, you've already committed it. He says, if you commit, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But, but if you've hated a person in your heart, and that seems like, God, that's like a really high standard. And in some sense, and, in, and he's absolutely right, it is, because what Jesus was going after was Jesus was going after our hearts. He wanted to lead us to a place where we would understand. In fact, this is the purpose of the law in the Old Testament, is to lead us to a place of repentance, to lead us to a place of recognizing, I can't do this in my own strength. I can't be good enough. I can't love him enough. I can't be kind enough, merciful enough. I cannot do it in my own strength. And so Jesus was always going after the heart because if we would surrender our hearts to him, it says in Ezekiel that he would give us a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, a heart that would beat for, desire, chase after God. And that God would strengthen us. God would give us his heart. That God would give us all that we need to live out the kind of life that he had planned for us and the kind of life that every single one of us desires. And so what God is after is the heart. Because you see, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And so when we think about sacrifice, when we think about building altars, we're not building physical altars anymore, but what God is saying when he spoke through Joshua and he said, I want you to consecrate yourself. I want you to dedicate yourself. When he spoke through Paul in Romans chapter 7, he said, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. What they had in mind was this idea that the children of God, the people of God, would build an altar, a spiritual altar in their hearts that would give themselves. They would place themselves on that altar and say, Lord, I'm giving myself to you. So my question that I want to answer for myself and for us this morning is, well, how do we do that? If this is what God is calling us to as individuals, if this is what God is calling us to as a church family this morning, how do we build an altar? And I want to leave you with three really quick thoughts, and we're going to unpack them over the next two weeks. We're going to put them into practice this morning. We're going to put them into practice next week. Uh, We're going to put them into practice during the week individually, and we're going to come together at some special times of prayer and worship for our for our family here. But, but three thoughts. And the first thing is this. How do we build an altar? How do we give our hearts to God? And the first thing is this, that we would be a people of prayer. 
that we would pray. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit more over the next coming week, and I guarantee you um, that, that, in fact, uh, if I was just to ask you the question, how many of you would say, man, I, just, I, I wish I had a better prayer life. I wish I had a more robust prayer life, right? Come on, we're in church. Can we, can we just respond? How many would say, nope, I've got it all figured out. My prayer life is great. That's awesome. Hey, so keep your hands up for a second. Keep your hands up for a second. Okay. I just want you to look around the room. Here are a group of us. that I've got my hand raised, by the way. My wife has her hand raised. And, and what I'm saying to you this morning is that as you look around the room, we all want to grow in this area. We all need Jesus' help. Because prayer is this kind of relationship. It's this communion with Jesus. And, and yesterday was kind of a sad day in our house because um, my family left. My, my parents went to Ireland and my two kids went back to the East Coast. You know? And so I was kind of laying on the couch yesterday. It was really funny. It was about five o'clock. It was pitch black and I hadn't turned on any lights. I just wanted to be depressed. <laughs> just being real. And I was rehearsing in my mind. I was thinking about all of the things that, like just the, the time that we had over the last three weeks. And you know what I was thinking about? I wasn't thinking about the gifts that I got, although we, I got my kids blessed me with some great new Nikes. They're awesome. Right? I wasn't thinking about the gifts. I wasn't thinking about the food, what we ate. I wasn't thinking about the trips that we took. I was just thinking about the relationship. I was thinking about the conversations that we had. And as I'm laying on the couch, it's all dark, and I'm trying to be all mopey and depressed, you know, and uh, all melancholy and all this. And, and the Lord spoke to me. It was like I was laying on the couch, and I was thinking about just, oh, God, I'm so grateful for the relationships that I have with my kids and my parents, you know. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that's what I want with you. I want that kind of relationship with you. God wants that kind of relationship with you. And sometimes what we do with prayer, and we'll talk about this more over the next few weeks, sometimes what we do with prayer is we think of it as a duty. It's like, oh, I gotta get up and I gotta pray, you know? And, uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that took 15 seconds. What am I gonna do for the next 10 minutes? And it's like we're trying to fill this time when, when God's just saying, no, 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 I, I, I just, just pray what you've got. Like, I just wanna hear from your heart. I want you to stop and listen. Read my word as Pastor Aaron was teaching us last week. Like, I just want to spend some time with you. And a few months ago, I had this kind of, we as a staff have been teasing out this thought a little bit on Tuesday mornings when we gather for prayer in chapel. Um, this idea that God waits up all night so that he can spend some time with you in the morning. I mean, think about this. God, the creator of the universe, it says that Jesus makes intercession before the throne of God for you, that God's waiting up. He's watching over you at night, and he's watching your, your sleep. He's giving you rest, but he can't wait for you to wake up because he wants to spend some time with you. That's a game changer, isn't it? That changed for me how I looked at prayer. That prayer wasn't a duty. It wasn't a responsibility. It was like a delight. It's something that Jesus, I just want to lay out before you my thoughts, my prayers. In fact, this is what it actually says in Psalm verse 5. And this is out of the, the Passion Translation. It says, at each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice as I prepare my sacrifice of prayer to you. Every morning, I lay out the pieces of my life on the altar and wait for your, your fire to fall upon my heart. Wow. God's waiting for us. Are we waking up in the morning and laying those things out before him? We'll talk some more about that, but there are some things that we're gonna do throughout the, the coming weeks. On Tuesday mornings, man, I wanna invite you. If you're close by and can work it out, come at seven o'clock. Come join us for some prayer. I don't care if there's five people here or there's 50 people here, 500 people here. I don't care. Here's what I do know. More prayer is better than less prayer. I also know that prayer is the most resisted activity on the planet. And when you wake up on Tuesday morning, you go to bed on Tuesday or Monday night with the full intent that I'm going to come on Tuesday morning. When you wake up on Tuesday morning, you're probably going to be resisted because the bed's going to feel really comfortable. And, you know, because it's so dark right now, like, I just don't want to get out of bed. I'm like, Lord, it's just awesome in here, you know. But why don't you start your morning with this way and say, Lord, as I'm laying here on this pillow, Lord, I'm just surrendering my heart to you. I'm just giving myself to you right now. Second thing is this. Uh, so we can pray. 
And we're, we're gonna do some times of prayer together. We'll do it on Tuesday morning the next two weeks. Uh, next Wednesday night, the 19th, I'm gonna invite anybody that's involved in ministry. In fact, it's just open to everybody. We're gonna do a team night here. And then as Aaron's already mentioned, we're gonna do a pursuit night here on the 23rd that night. Special times of prayer together with one another, amen? The second thing that we can do is we can pray. This is how we build an altar. We can pray, number one. Number two, we can fast. Now, how many of you have heard of fasting or ever fasted before? And I don't mean intermittent fasting, by the way. <laughs> That's trendy and fashionable. That's good. That's awesome. Uh, but I mean biblical fasting. And, and what is a fast? A fast is, is us aligning our hearts with God. It's me saying, I'm going to set this aside, and the Bible teaches us to set food aside. Now, in the world in which we live, probably wouldn't hurt us to turn off the TV, close down the social media, and to say, Lord, I'm setting all of that stuff aside, and rather than me swiping, eating, doing some of those kinds of things, I'm actually going to set that time aside, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to give myself, consecrate, dedicate, set myself aside. I'm going to set this aside so that I can have you so that I can be with you, so that I can be in your presence. And we see it throughout Scripture, right? Moses fasted, the Israelites fasted, Daniel fasted, Nehemiah fasted, Jesus fasted, the early Christians, they fasted. Fasting is a habit, a practice, a spiritual thing that Christians, those who follow Jesus, do. And there's something, I can't tell you, those who have fasted know this. And I was talking to one of our elders a couple of months ago who had just spent some time fasting, and she was telling me, my goodness, i can't got to tell you what God has done in my life. That when we set time aside, when we set food aside, that God will meet with us, that God encounters us. It says in Joel 1, 14, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land, that's all of you, and to the house of your God and cry out to God. Something happens when we fast. And there's different ways that we can fast. And, and I want to encourage you to go to our website, uh, alcpnw.com slash seek first. And we've created all kinds of resources for you to help you understand a little bit more about fasting. It might be that you do a full fast, that you take a day, two days, three days, and you say, man, I'm only going to drink water. I'm going to set time aside. It might be that you take uh, a partial day. You take a meal one day. It might be that you do a Daniel fast where you only eat maybe vegetables and, and water, and you just say, man, I'm going to set this time aside to seek Jesus together. We as a staff are setting this Wednesday aside, and I'd invite any and all of you to join us. We're setting Wednesday aside, and we're going to do a fast together. We're going to take the day and not eat. We're going to pray and seek God. We're asking for God's presence to lead us and to guide us and to show us the way forward as we head into 2022. I'm telling you, if you will take some time to fast, to set food aside, to push aside the distractions of the world, God will meet with you. God will encounter you. And the last thing that we can do is this, is so we can pray. How do we build an altar? How do we give God our hearts? Number one, we pray. Number two, we fast. And number three is this, we can worship. We worship. It says this in, in Hebrews chapter 13. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of, lip, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And, and it might be that, man, you, you come to church on a Sunday morning and, and uh, man, the, you know, we've got a pretty cool band, you know, don't you think? Our band's awesome, isn't it? Man, Pastor Scott and those guys, they just do an awesome job. And, and if we're not careful, we can kind of come into a place like this and go, man, band killed it this morning. They just slayed it. Or, you know, sometimes, ugh, seemed a little flat today, you know? And, and it's like, what are we doing? It's like we come, into, we come into worship sometimes and we're like, you know, scorecard, <laughs> you know? You get a nine today, you know? There's one point with more there, room for improvement, right? And we fail to recognize that, no, 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 we are the Levites. We are the priests. We are the ones that bring an offering of praise, right? Lifting up holy hands. You know, you go throughout the Bible and they clap and they bow and they kneel and they lift up holy hands and they play instruments and they, some people ought to just whistle, but that's okay. Whistling is worship too, right? That, that, that when you read through the Bible, they were, they were created to bring worship to God. 
We don't come into this place to receive worship. We don't come into this place to give a scorecard. We come into this place to offer up praise and worship. And it's interesting because this is, once again, something that we see in the Old Testament. And I'd encourage you to go read 1 Chronicles 13, 14, 15, 16. The story was that the Ark, which was the tab- or the Ark of the Covenant, was like the representative of, a representation of God's presence with his people. And, and they cherished it and they protected it. But the Philistines attacked Israel and they, they conquered Israel and they stole the Ark and they took it back. David gets raised up. David says, we got to go get the Ark. So they go get the ark, they crush the Philistines, and they bring the ark back. Now, in the process, they mishandle the presence of God. They don't carry the ark correctly. They don't follow what the Bible teaches them about following or leading, carrying the ark. And so God smotes or smites or whatever that word, he kills a few people, right, who mishandle the presence of God. And what happens is that, that it stops in a place of, it stops in the field or the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. And we love the story of Obed-Edom because it was like the Midas touch. God's favor rested upon Obed-Edom. And everything, he was blessed and favored. Why? Because of God's presence. And David, he says, man, we've got to go back. We've got to do this thing right. We've got to handle the presence of God rightly. and We've got to bring it back to, uh, to Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting because the tabernacle was actually in Gibeon. And in Gibeon, there's all these priests that are sacrificing bulls and goats and all of these animals. And David doesn't take it back to Gibeon. He takes it to Jerusalem. And what he does is he he has thousands of Levites, thousands of musicians, thousands of priests that parade before the tabernacle, the presence of God. And they're singing and declaring the praises and glory of God. And they bring the tabernacle back to this tent that David is constructed in Jerusalem, and they place the tabernacle in the tent, or they place the Ark of the Covenant, sorry, in the tent. And then what David does is David doesn't reinstate all the priestly systems that sacrifice bulls and animals and all that kind of stuff. You know what David does? David raises up musicians and worship leaders and singers that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sing praises and adoration to God. You know what the prophets point back to? You know what the New Testament points back to? Never points back to the temple. Never points back to Gibeon. Never points back to that sacrificial system. It says that God's going to reinstate the tabernacle of David. A people who know how to honor and praise and worship God. Look what it says in Psalm 100. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Shout with joy. I know if you were at a Seahawks game, you know, you know what that's like, right? Actually, this year, you don't know what that's like. But <laughs> if you were a Packer fan like me, you know what that would be like, to shout with joy. It's okay for us to shout with joy. It's okay for us to be excited to be in God's presence. And he goes on and he says, worship the Lord with sadness. No, that's not what it says. Now, some Christians do a really good job of worshiping the Lord with sadness. But the Lord says, worship me with gladness. It's okay to smile. It's okay to delight. It's okay to rejoice. It's okay to enjoy God's presence because God, through the invitation of Christmas, says, I'm coming to be with you. Will you respond to the invitation by coming and being with me? Bring an offering of sacrifice. Bring a praise. Bring something to the Lord when you come to church. And he goes on and he says, come before him, singing with joy, acknowledging that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For, the God, for God is good or the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. His faithfulness continues to each generation. And, and the word for praise there. Is, is this Hebrew word that literally means this spontaneous, heartfelt song that comes out of my spirit to God. And when you and I understand what Jesus has done for us, when we understand the invitation that Jesus has extended to us, we can't help but respond by saying, God, I'm coming to you. I'm coming into your presence. I'm gonna respond to that invitation. And that's what we want to do right now. 
we want to respond to the invitation. We want to respond by building an altar. And, and here's what I'd love to do. Would you just all stand with me right now? And, and then I want you just to close your eyes. So once you've got your bearings and you're not going to fall over, just close your eyes. We're bringing an offering of praise. Some of you, man, I don't know about you. I, I know for me, I, man, I can get lost in worship. It's a dangerous thing for me to put on a song sometimes in my car and my eyes start to close. I'm just like, oh God, I'm in your presence. When our team was just rehearsing this morning, man, I was just overwhelmed. I was, I was walking through the, the rows of seats this morning just in tears. And I just said, God, I, I just offer up a sacrifice of praise. Might the fruit of my lips constantly bring you honor. See, this is how we build an altar. We bring a sacrifice. We bring ourselves, but man, we, we bring a sacrifice of praise. We offer up prayers. We set aside some of the delicacies and the things that sustain us and say, no, 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 you're the one that truly sustains me, Jesus. First Peter says that your living stones that that are being built together and that you offer up a sacrifice that pleases the heart of God. You, you actually have the opportunity and the ability to please the heart of God. And it starts by offering your heart. It starts by saying, Lord, I know what you're after my obedience and my loyalty and all of those other things, they're going to follow my heart. See, it's out of the heart flow the issues of life. It's out of the heart that your mouth speaks. And, and everything that flows in and through your life flows in and through your heart. When you go to the doctor, the doctor, one of the first things they do is they check your heart because it's central. And this is a heart check moment. This is a moment at the start of the year for us to, man, just open up our hearts, lift up our hands, to just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you me right now. I'm giving you my heart right now. And I, I want you more than anything else in 2022. I know that if I seek first you and your kingdom, that and all these other things, they're going to fall into place. But it starts with me seeking you, me consecrating myself to you, me offering myself as a living sacrifice. So come on, would you just put your hands up? If that's your prayer this morning, Lord, we're, we're here. Lord, we know what moves your heart. It's us. It's us giving ourselves to you. It's us acknowledging that, Lord Jesus, you are first. You are foremost. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, Lord, in this space right now, we're giving ourselves to you. We're giving ourselves to you.
just want to I just want to move your heart It's all I want to do I just want to stand here And pour my love on you No matter how much Really give it all Really give it all Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we pour our hearts out to you. Lord, you know our hearts. You see our hearts. God, there's nothing hidden from our, you. God, you see everything. So, Lord, we're just going to lay that down before you. We just rend our hearts to you, Lord. Lord, you say, return to me. Come to me. Come to me with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, if need be. Lord, you are a compassionate, loving God. Lord, you don't all look at us and say, oh, I can point my finger at that. No, God. You're calling us. You're, you're wooing us. Lord, you love us. Lord, we just surrender it to you. Whatever it is, God, you can take care of it. Lord, we come to you. We come to you. We surrender it to you. We surrender our hearts. We love you, Lord. How great you are. Yes. You are awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, in this place, prayer has happened, worship has happened, memorials have been built, but this is now, and you continue to work. You continue to work in this church. You continue to work in our lives. You have work to do in this neighborhood, and Lord, don't leave us behind. We wanna be a part of that, so we surrender. We consecrate, we bow on our knees before you. We will fast, we will pray, we will worship because we want to be a part, of, a part of what you are doing. Lord, we don't want to miss the miracles that are going to happen in this place, in our hearts, in our lives, and in this neighborhood. So we surrender all to you. Amen.
And here I give my vows. Is it a song I see? Then here's every melody. Tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. Father, we come before you with a humble heart, Lord. We ask, Father, that you meet us here today, Father, that you meet us every day of our lives, Lord. I pray that we will be able to encounter you. I pray that we will be the church that puts you first, God. I pray that as this year goes on, that we will be able to reach more and more people because of the encounter that we had with you and that our lives may be transformed, Lord. Perform miracles in this church. Build our church, Father. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Gracias, Señor, por... Gracias, Padre, por este día, Padre. Gracias por cada una de las personas que está aquí con nosotros, Padre. Gracias por cada uno de los que está viendo el servicio, Padre, en su casa. Te estoy pidiendo, Padre, por, por un encuentro. Que cada uno de nosotros tenga un encuentro, Padre, contigo, Señor. Te pido que, que seamos un reflejo de tu Hijo amado, Padre, porque somos cristianos, Señor, y... Y tenemos que alumbrar, Señor, para que otros vengan, Señor, a tu casa, Padre. Te pido por, por cada una de las personas que está aquí, Señor, te pido que tenga un encuentro más contigo, Padre. Si ya te conoció, Padre, que, que siga, Señor, acercándose más a ti, porque así lo, lo dice Jesús, Padre, y, y es el deseo de nuestro corazón, Señor. En el nombre de Jesús, amén.